welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. Back pain, stiff muscles, achy joints, the list of ailments people experience as they age is a mile long as you're probably nodding right now. And while many believe these sorts of symptoms are an inevitable part of getting older, my guest today says that that simply isn't true. In just a minute, I'm going to be speaking with the healthy movement coach, Aaron Alexander, author of the upcoming book, Align, Five Easy Steps to Transform Your Posture. As the owner and founder of Align Therapy, Aaron helps people improve their strength, balance, flexibility, and structural alignment to live healthier, happier lives pain-free. One of his specialties is rolfing, a form of physical manipulation intended to align your body. Now we're going to explain how that works in just a moment. Today we'll discuss how some seemingly normal everyday habits can hurt your body and how rolfing, massage, and healthy movement can help. We'll also talk about what you can do today to start feeling better in your body and avoid big picture problems down the road. Aaron, welcome to the program. Now, I first met Aaron in a very unique way a couple years ago, and I want to tell you about that right now. It was by far the most interesting interview that I have ever given. Uh, we're in my office with our guest, and my guest says, I would like to interview you with you being suspended above my body. <laughs> and he says, if you don't mind, uh, I'm going to lay down on the floor, I'm going to put my legs and my hands up, and you're going to dive onto me and I'm going to catch you, and we're going to do this interview talking with you suspended above me. Am I right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and i got to tell you, I have never been interviewed suspended above some person's body, at least to my knowledge, and that's a way to get interviewed, let me tell you. So, Aaron, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having and me. And I'm shocked, or, you know, I really thought we'd start this segment with me suspended above you, but <laughs> glad to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Aaron, you've helped countless people re prevent and reverse the issues that cause pain and discomfort. Okay, what led you down this path, and did you yourself have a physical issue that you needed to overcome? Yeah, yeah, all sorts of stuff. So I started from a place, like a lot of young people, of, of just insecurity and um, kind of had like somewhat of an unstable household in certain ways. And the story that I kind of tell along that is that because I felt unstable in my material environment, I kind of packed on my biological environment. And so I just started slamming on slabs of muscle the best that I could through imbalanced bodybuilding practices. And then that led into me just focusing on what you could see in the mirror. You know, so like, pecs and buys and triceps and abs and just all this kind of like adding on to the forward flexed position, which is already that of what modernity is doing to us anyway. And ever since you're in a cradle or you know in a child's seat and then on these chairs and then on the bus and the plane, it's all pulling us into this position which has all sorts of other implications. And within that from just like a purely structural level, you could say like the muscles at the back and the hips and the glutes and the legs, like the parts that really hold you together and give you true strength are typically the parts that people don't really directly see. But most of us focus on the parts that we see only, and that's only impressive for a short term, but long term it's really unstable. So, it, you know, let's, let's continue on that. So is there such a thing as muscle bound? Muscle bound, there's muscle imbalanced. So you can grow as, as large as you want as long as you maintain integrity and functionality of what you're doing. You know, so if you're a person, like fitness is, is based off of what, what are you fit for? Like that's the relevant question that's of a fitness. Good point. Like anything with fitness is like, well, if you wear high heels all the time and you kind of strut around and pull your shoulders back and you do business meetings and you stand in elevators, you're fit for that. Whereas someone like a hunter-gatherer, if you put them in that situation, they would be unfit for that situation. And it would be challenging for them to succeed in that world. Now, so you can train yourself. The big question is just like, what am I training for? What is the outcome that I'm seeking? Once you figure that out, then it's like, okay, now let's create the program from there. So you're saying you can train for wearing, wearing high heels? Yeah, yeah, you can. I, I, high heels, so high heels throughout history have been used by, they were used by, by Persian soldiers to be able to ride on horseback and right. be able to sling a bow, and they were used by 
uh, what was it? Was it King Henry the Fourteenth? I think was who it was originally. He had he was originally like the the the, the five inch high red heels. That was him and his main crew was an indication of their royalty. And so if you got taken out of those heels, it was like oh you've you've obviously got out of the royal society. You know, so they've been used as tools and as indicators throughout history. So if you use them as a as a temporary tool for like less than an hour then I think that they're fine, there's value to them. Um, but it's if you use a power them, tool. It's a power tool, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Mm. Yeah, so, but in short bursts, you can use that power for your benefit. But if you use that, it becomes your whole life, well then you become kind of consumed by the imbalance patterns of that. But in short little bursts, I think heels are okay. How about for guys? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think they could go fine for guys too. I mean, that's originally like heels are actually more of a masculine thing. It's soldiers, royal. Well, yeah, it was cabinet. from horseback riding. It was a hook on a, a stirrup. Yeah. That was one of the original reasons yeah. to wear a heel. Yeah, that's right. It's amazing how things how things change. And originally, men were were more. Um, they would wear more like. Uh, you know, reds and bright colors, and they'd have the ruffles, and it was like. Then it kind of changed to more of like they were the or, They were the original metrosexual. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah gotcha. exactly. All right. So you teach people how to care for their joints, develop good posture, improve their balance, and achieve proper alignment. So, okay. So what are some of the bad habits that you see in your line of work? And how do they affect people's bodies? Oh, man. Well, the, big, the interesting question is how they affect people's minds and the way they think and feel about themselves. You know, so depression is the number one leading cause of disability worldwide presently. It was supposed to be like by 2020, but it, it already happened. Um, in tandem, as that's happening, people's structural patterns are veering towards this hunched over, kind of morose type archetypal position. Like if you feel sad, you deflate into this, oh, man. If you feel like you won, this is an integrated pattern throughout millennia. It'd be like, oh, we did it, success. You know, you show your vital organs and you express it like, cool, I feel safe, I feel strong, I feel confident. Throughout culture, we're being put into these positions via chairs, via staring into our phones, via the computer, via tables, all of the things, even sitting at your toilet. You know, raising the toilet up off the ground so you don't have to actually go through a full range of hip flexion and knee flexion, that's brand new. You know, and as you go into that range of motion, you literally elongate the rectum to allow you to defecate correctly. You know, so our environment's folding, uh, folding us into this position, and at the same time, simultaneously, we're seeing people become a little bit more glum. You know, so I think that the really interesting question, there's so many different ways to, to look at it, but I'm really enamored by how your physical positioning affects the way that you think and the way that you feel. You know, and so you see, just for example, people in this position all day long. So the obvious anatomical indicators of that, forward head posture, medial rotation of the shoulders, hyperkyphotic spine, disengaged glutes, valgus knees, it's collapse. Expansion, collapse. But isn't, uh, isn't it just so much easier <laughs> to kind of get into this almost fetal position? <laughs> it's only easier because I mean, why do people do that? To. There's a lot of reasons. There's nothing wrong with that position. That position's just one of the many colors of your emotional physical palette. This emotional pattern is an indication that you, maybe you're highly concentrated. That could be a thing as well. Um, or you're protecting, or you're sad, or you want to guard and hide. You know, so doing you know, body work, manual therapy, rolfing, that's with working with people, sometimes really what we want to do is we want to put them into a, a more closed position because it makes them feel safe. You could also use heavy blankets, put that heavy weight over top of their body and they feel safer. So now you can start to kind of Jedi yourself into some of those deeply held patterns. You know, so that position, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. It just has an effect. You know, so if all you paint is with black and gray, your painting will have a certain expression. You know, so if you can change your postural patterns, it's like, cool, let's throw some red and some purple and some different colors to change the way that you express. You know, you bring up a good point there. Uh, you see on TV and on the internet, they're, they're advertising these really heavy blankets that you can sleep with to make you feel protected. And uh, dog, there, there's thunder jackets that you can yep. wrap your dog in to make them feel protected. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually did this with one of our rescue dogs that I talked about on one of our other podcasts. This poor dog was just 
scared to death of thunder, and he's, he's a very aloof animal. And I got him in the bed, and I just wrapped him as hard as I could, and he finally calmed down. It was actually kind of the first, I think, human interaction he felt comfortable with. Oh, yeah. So do, are you saying that those sorts of things, uh, that's cool, that's all right? I mean, should I? Those sorts of things are amazing, powerful tools to have access to. But when that's the only tool that you have access to, it's like see, like your only realm of healthcare is through seeing a surgeon. It's like, okay, cool. What's wrong with that? Hey! I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but no, seriously. So, so, so if you're not looking from the other steps before that, then from that perspective, if they're, they're really myopic with their vision, they don't have any education outside of that, which isn't you at all, um, then you say, oh, I have this neck pain, I have this shoulder pain, or I have this thing. It's like, well, my education is, is only formed around that one specific solution, so now I see that. You know, so if it's like, you know, if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Right. So if all you have is this one position, which is the cultural mold of society, then it becomes potentially problematic because, you know, it, the fact that depression is the number one lead cause, cause of disability in the world is like astounding to me. You know, and so when you look around the world, just, just notice people holding their cell phones and staring at the coffee shop and hunching over. Take away, like take it back to hunter-gatherer time frame. They don't know what a computer is. They don't know what a cell phone is. You don't see that. You don't know that they're deeply into their text message or whatever. So you're like, okay, it's fine. You would look at that person and you'd say, oh, what's wrong? You know, so at a physiological level, there's been various different studies that associate those positions into reducing testosterone levels, increasing stress hormone, cortisol specifically. They've even shown that being in those hunched over positions helps for you to be able to access more like challenging memories. Whereas being in the upright position helps for you to be able to access more you know, beneficial, stimulating, good time memories. So, okay, why, other than we're reading or looking at our cell phones all the time, yeah. Why is that the default position that everybody ends up in? And I know you're going to tell us why that is and how we can get out of that default position. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the way that your car seat is formed. It's the way that your couch is formed. It's the way that, your, again, your toilet, um, your bed, you're only getting down to about 90 degrees of hip flexion. So a really beautiful, easy, simple, accessible way that people can start to shift that is to just add a, a, a small dose and it will start to expand because it comes kind of addictive because you can feel the effects, but of spending more time on the ground throughout the day. You know, so I'm sitting on this chair essentially as though I'm on the ground. You know, as, we're, as we're doing this, this is helpful because it's beneficial for my circulation. You know, so I'm bringing my legs closer to my heart. True. That's convenient, which is beneficial for digestion, for example, i.e. most cultures around the world eat from the ground. You know, so why, why would I want to have my legs so far away from my vital organs so that blood can just start to kind of pull up in my lower compartments? I want to be easier. If I could, I would do this interview with my feet up the wall, you know, and so we can just lay down and hang back and really like that would be super medicinal for both of us. It's a little, from a society perspective, it's a little funny, but from a biological perspective, it's really exactly what your body needs. So spending just a little bit of time on the ground each day, throw your legs up the wall to kind of bring that circulation back to the heart, and then we can expand on it from there. But that's just one thing. There's, you know, there's a lot of things you can do. Okay, so uh, we're, we're talking about kind of simple things we can do, and you ought to put your legs up on a wall, which is a, actually a classic yoga position yep. that we use in, in yoga all the time. And I think you're right. Uh, people don't realize that we should have been built with a heart uh, down in our <laughs> lower extremities. We, we actually have no heart to pump blood back to our heart. And we actually depend on muscular action to make that happen. And people often you know, don't realize that there is no pump except your muscles to uh, get blood back uh, to the rest of you. Yeah. And uh, we do neglect that area. Because you're right, back when we were all hunter-gatherers, that muscle was working all the time. Or if it wasn't, we were in a position like this, or you know, so many of the third worlds I, I visit, everybody is sitting on their, you know, haunched over, sitting on their, you know, on their feet. And everything's compacted in a straight line uh, yeah. beneath them. Yeah. Okay, so what are uh, 
what can they do? Uh, so we got one idea, put your legs up or yep. get on the ground. Get on the ground. Yep. Uh, what are your thoughts about Pilates and yoga? We I think they're both great. I think Pilates has a tendency of, of focusing on um, integration and yoga oftentimes integration being like activation and finding neutrality through the spine and finding core engagement and engaging with your breath it's just like you know uh iyengar said breath is the the king of the mind you know it's the king of the nervous system it's if you can engage and be aware of of that inhalation exhalation you can literally see in real time the status of your autonomic nervous system and you can start to create power through compression with your breath so i think pilates is awesome for that um, what it lacks is it lacks dynamic, ballistic, like expressive movement. You know, yoga is kind of similar, but yoga is going to be more towards like, oftentimes people end up going too far in the mobility realm in yoga, and they lack that, that tension aspect that Pilates does a really good job with. Um, but both of them are just, again, different tools, but I find value in both. Yeah, I do a power Pilates on a active reformer cool. you know, where, um, and it's really funny, you, you know, you mentioned, you know, really muscle bound guys and we'll see big time weightlifters come in and start doing power Pilates. Yeah, it'd be hard. And yeah, and the instructor usually gives us all a wink and say, watch this. And these incredible muscle bound guys are just reduced to a sweating mass of, you know, of jelly because they, they can't move through these actions. And it's always, it's, uh, it's... Yeah, it's coordination of the parts. You know, so if you start, it's kind of like being very wealthy. You know, when you're very wealthy, you just become more of yourself. You know, so when you become very muscular, those imbalances start showing themselves more. So now you have these huge slabs of muscle that you have to integrate back together. It would be almost easier for the person that just takes walks each day to start from that baseline of, okay, here's how you integrate your parts. Because you haven't expanded yourself out into this mutated form. But again, it's not mutated, it sounds like it's like a bad thing. It's, it's what you want. If your goal is to stand up on a stage and oil yourself up and like that's what your goal is, you're doing a great job, it's beautiful. But there is a way to actively integrate your parts as you choose whatever it is you want to do with your body, including body, including bodybuilding. Okay. Yep. So can people injure themselves by doing Pilates or yoga? You hear yeah. that in the news all the time. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So, so yoga, the big thing with, within anything, if you follow basic, there's, there's a few simple baseline fundamentals of, of movement mechanics that are consistent throughout any practice. And you'll see them throughout Pilates and yoga and martial arts and dance and weightlifting, Olympic weightlifting, all of that. And if you follow those basic fundamental principles, it's really challenging to injure yourself in literally any kind of movement practice. Um, what happens is yoga is an easy example where people kind of let go of some of those fundamentals because they want to get their head back or their leg behind their head and they want to be able to lick their knee. And it's like, okay, it's cool that you can do that, but what's your goal here? You know, so when you start to blow out some of those fundamental principles to be able to lick the back of your knee, that's when injuries start to pop up. Should I be able to lick the back of my knee? <laughs> if you want to, I think that's great, but it's not necessary, no. <laughs> it won't help you hunt, gather, work, do anything. Unless Will it make me a better person? I don't think it'll make you a better person. <laughs> Good, good. Unless it brings you more self-worth, in, in which case it gives you like that temporary validation to get you the next step in life, then maybe licking your knees is exactly what you need. All <laughs> these things are based from a psychological perspective. Like what's, what is it that makes you feel the need to lick your knee in the first place? You know, what is it that, that, that makes you feel the need to pack on all of this muscle? I think asking those questions specifically just makes fitness a lot more interesting. Well, you know, you, you mentioned bodybuilding uh, became a way of you, you know, I guess reacting against the tensions in your family life and all that but growing up. Back in the 50s and 60s, uh, there was this advertisement in all the magazines of this kid being kicked sand in his face in the beach, a skinny, scrawny guy, and he was going to, you know, become a great bodybuilder and go back to that guy. Yep. Um, and so that, you know, clearly, even back in, in those days, that was... You know, oh, yeah. It's all about what you're, you're, like, the word trauma is a word that gets used a lot. And sometimes when I hear trauma, I'm like, oh, God, trauma again. Um, but I think trauma, it's all your, your filter of that experience. What's your perception of that experience? 
So if you can retool your perception of getting sand kicked in your face or your childhood fill in the blank thing or the girlfriend or the boyfriend or the, the death, and change it and say, wow, since that experience, it caused me to take care of my body. I lost all that fat. I started reading all those books and I, I started this business. I became an entrepreneur and I gained all these new relationships and like now here I am. You know, so that trauma, in quotations, was actually an opportunity for me to do like a fast forward education into getting me to the point that I'm at. As opposed to looking as like, oh, woe is me. Like my family life was tough. You know, as long as you hold on to that story of like, I'm a victim, I have it tough, I think it spills into the way that you move through the world. Very true. Uh, you know, it's like Tony Robbins always said, we, you can't keep playing old movies. Yeah, um, it's like the definition of depression. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're, 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 I mean, I don't know if that's, the, I wouldn't say that's the definition of depression, but I think it's no, a big part of it. No, it, is a, it here, is a big part. Your, your mind is all these other places thinking about that, and then anxiety, you know, they say is like your, your mind is in the front. And even as you're doing that, actually, there's a structural effect. Chronesthesia is an unnecessary fancy term for like internal time travel. You know, so when you're doing that chronesthesia and you're thinking into the future or you're obsessing over the past, You'll literally, your, your postural patterns will start to go forward a few millimeters when you're in the future. They'll get, drift back a little bit when you're in the past. You know, and so when you're actually completely here in the present moment, your body, almost like a compass, kind of like doop, 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 comes back into being in a more upright position. Yeah, it reminds me of one of my favorite reggae artists who's now dead, Lucky Dube from, from Africa. Mm. And one of his songs, uh, he throws in a line that objects in the rear view mirror appear closer than they are, really are. Mm, and yep. you know, it's, it's on your rear view mirror thingy. And his point is, which was very well taken, is those things are actually way in the past, but yep. they appear closer th and bother you more than they really could. Yep. And I thought it was a great line. Yep. So just objects in the rear view mirror appear closer than yep. they really are. And then it sabotages your present because you're stuck yeah. there. And then you keep on t potentially sabotaging this, this present experience because your mind's not with it. And then your world doesn't come together the way that it could because people don't want to be around a, a, a distracted mind. It's the worst. You know, when someone's looking down at their phone and you're talking to them or you, you just know they're not there with you, I'm just like, get the hell out of here. You know, and if that's the way that you lead through the world, you, things probably won't work the way that you would prefer them to and very likely you may fall back on that victim story and just keep spinning your wheels in that but that's kind of maybe separate than like a postural conversation but All I don't right. think it is so are, yeah <laughs> let's pull you back yeah. okay. <laughs> so are there any bad forms of exercise are there really uh, you got any that you don't like or you no. say no, I don't like. Hey. I think everything's good. It's just following the basic fundamental principles within it. CrossFit's an easy one to like poop on, um, but the issue with CrossFit is that it's it's time and it's competition with really complex movements. But really complex movements are great for the human organism. It's just a matter of we need to be focusing on instead of it being get this time or do this much weight. We need to be focusing on the quality of the movement. You know, so if instead of it being that you did it in this amount of time, it could be like, oh, you did it with this, you know, you did it with zero movement faults, you could call it. Like the, your positioning was immaculate the whole way through. You get the gold star, and then I think CrossFit's like a tremendous movement practice. Um, yoga, it would be another easy one to, to, to poo-poo on because people focus on hypermobility and, and just like getting their joints in these weird positions. But the truth of yoga, like it, it means union or connection, yoke. Yuj is the Sanskrit terminology for it. And so connection is a synonymous with integration. And so if you're focused on <sighs> integrating your parts through a wide range of movement, your yoga practice is great. You know, so within anything, anything that would be easy to crap on, it's, 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 you're going to the far ends of the spectrum where people start to tear themselves apart. But like the, the, the center point of any movement practice, I think there's, there's value. It's just following the basic fundamentals of movement. All right. People who aren't familiar with rolfing might think it sounds a little wacky. So what yep. the heck is rolfing? Yeah, it's not the best branded name. 
Um, so it sounds like rolling on the floor laughing. Um, structural integration is what Ida Rolf, the founder of it, originally called it. Um, and it, a similar... So wait a minute, there, there was a Joseph Pilates and now you're trying Joseph to convince Pilates. me there was an Ida Rolf. There was an Ida Rolf, yeah. yeah she's didn't consider down. changing her name. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. So she didn't like it called Rolfing. Like that wasn't her, her prerogative. So it was after she was on her way out that people started saying like, oh, you got Rolfed. You know, so it was like if you had, you know, a special practice with, with, with patients, it'd be like, oh, you got gundried. And then eventually it's like, it happened. Gundry. Yes. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, I believe it. You know, so said that, that's originally what that is. And the main focus of, of structural integration, which is a, a better umbrella term for what it is, is you're integrating your parts through manual hands on manipulation. And so a f essentially, you're looking to align your feet to your knee, to your hip, through your spine to the top of your head. And then if you can find that alignment within the field of gravity, then your existence, your inhabitants in your body, it makes you healthier because you don't have these little forest fires that are manifesting in all of your joints because of all the friction. So what we're looking to do from that perspective is looking to align the joints via the connective tissue so that just the way that you move through the world heals your body. So how's that different than what a chiropractor would do, for instance? Chiropractors are focusing on more high velocity adjustments and they're focusing from more of like a, you know, a bony perspective, whereas a structural integration NIST is focusing on fascia or connective tissue and slow adjustments. Uh, people have the impression, and I've certainly had a lot of people who have been rolfed, that it is incredibly painful <laughs> because yeah. you're breaking down fascia. Is that true or is that a... Old school, old school rolfing has the tendency of being a little bit more that and they're kind of really going for like the cathartic like hoorah. Um, present day approach, it really depends. It's like, say, it's like going to one Chinese restaurant and being like, oh, I know what all of Chinese food tastes like now. You're like, well, you just had one angry chef that put too much hot sauce in the noodles. You know, and so then f what we end up doing is we attach to that kind of, you know, if it bleeds, it leads kind of thing. It's easy, it's just easier for our minds to process that. Really working effectively with the body is being able to be sensitive enough to feel exactly where there's resistance in the tissue, which is in the form of tissue dehydration, agglomeration, and being able to just essentially almost sit right at that. It's just like if someone has like a door closed, you go and you sit right at the door and you say, okay, we're just gonna be right here. And if you choose to open the door, it's okay. As opposed to me like slamming against the door to try to get it open. So like a good rolfer, they would be able to just find those closed doors and then bring your attention to them. And then through a slow, subtle, typically like shearing type force, we rehydrate those cells and realiven that tissue. It shouldn't be an overly painful process, but I'm not, completely against experiencing pain in order to experience some type of healing. I think that sometimes life is painful. You know, and so if you're always, you're always trying to resist that, sometimes you might actually, you know, it's like Rumi said, the, the cure for the pain is in the pain. And I think that sometimes it's okay to actually go into your pain in order to actually fully experience it out. <laughs> it's See, just this both. is how <laughs> Rolfing gets a bad no, name. No, 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 <laughs> it's, just be, it's just be accepting of the full scale of the human experience. But the pain should be a pain that is something that you can enjoy. Like if, if it's like a hurt so good because you know you're at the edge of something. Like imagine getting a splinter pulled out of your hand, right? You could feel it, you see it, you're like, oh God, like I need to get that splinter out. The sensation of someone actually finally touching the splinter that you've been feeling for the last 15 years and saying, oh, that's it. You say, yes, pull the splinter, please, please, please pull. Oh, 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 oh. It's like, yeah, that was painful. You activated, you activated sensory receptors and you kind of, you, you felt sensation, but it was in relief of something you've been, a greater pain that you've been holding for however long you've been holding it. So a, a truly artful, tactful, any person, any talk therapist, any manual therapist, what they're able to do is they're able to create an environment or a container for that person's nervous system, because that's what you're working with, right. in order to feel safe enough to start to unwind old patterns that haven't been serving them in the best way. You know, but as long as you put them into a place where they feel like they need to protect and guard up, they'll go back to what they know. And so in that situation, if you just inflict pain upon a body that is now protecting and guarding, you're only gonna make things worse, for the most part. 
So it's, it's being sensitive enough, this relates to any conversation or anything that you're doing, business, relationships, if you're sensitive enough to know what's the tone of voice that this person will respond to, what's the level of contact, what's the temperature in the room, what's the, the texture of the couch that they're on, all of those send signals to your nervous system whether you feel safe and you want to respond in an open way or whether you want to protect and guard. What's the difference between rolfing and massage and how are, are they complementary? Are they, you know? Typically, if you tell a rolfer that they're a massage therapist, like all their sphincters clench up and they're like, no. Um, but realistically, if you'd look at it from the outside perspective, you'd probably just assume they're getting like a slow massage. But one of the differences key differences from like structural integration to typical massage. Massage is such a big word. You know, so that's the issue with a word like massage. It's under this umbrella that relates just so many modalities. You know, so it's, it's really just semantics. But typically, people's ideas of massage would be more of like an effleurage, kind of like soothing, rubbing, oil, whale sounds in the background, spa. Rolfing is you're not using much oil, if any. Um, and it's just slow, sometimes deep, but not always deep pressure. It's focusing on muscular septa, which is the space between the muscle bellies. That's the highest concentration of mechanoreceptors and all the parts that make your, your muscles change, your connective tissue change. And so that's kind of what it looks like. It's, it's slower, oftentimes deep-ish work, not a lot of oil. And the goal is to integrate all of the parts together as opposed to just rub everything. Good description. <laughs> all right, so you know what? Now we're talking about all this. Uh, people, I'm sure, have said, or behind your back, maybe to your back, yeah. that the Rolfing is pseudoscience and pseudo scientific. Sure. What do you What do you say? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of pseudoscience in, in most of the of the the practices. I think that end up actually being really beneficial. The information that we're getting in textbooks in a Western doctor's office, from my understanding, that information is founded originally like 30 years back before it finally makes it in. It's actually 20, it, the practicing doctor is 20 years behind current research. Right. Um, I was in a, in a group a number of years ago called the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And the research had shown that the practicing physician, and this is not to belittle any practicing physician, yeah. their, their current pr treatment practice is 20 years behind current knowledge yeah. in all disciplines. Yeah. yeah, so that would probably put that whole 20 year gap into a large container of pseudoscience because it's not fully founded, established. Poof. You know, so there's a, I don't remember who the quote was, it was science describes the experience of the body from the outside and poetry describes it from the inside. You know, and I think that we can become too founded on its only scientific, measurable, beaker, double blind, or I don't trust it. You know, and then there's this other end of the spectrum that is just feeling more intuitively and feeling more, you know, they want you to paint as a means to work with your depression. Science, I don't know, it was like, well, try painting, see how it affects you. You know, so I like to kind of dance between both of those worlds. If I hear the word pseudoscience, I'm not like, no. I'm like, tell me more. Let's, let's see if how, how the effects are. That's a great segue into I happen to think that a great deal of depression and anxiety is caused by an altered gut microbiome and a leaky gut. Yep. And there's actually some pretty cool science that backs that up. So I know you're an ambassador to um, several nutrition brands. So I think we probably both agree that nutrition is a critical part of how we, how our bodies perform. Huge. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah 100%. Yeah. I absolutely agree. And I think it's interesting from, I think oftentimes with nutrition, an underlying root of seeking out really positive nutrition is a level of having a level of self-worth you know, to, to believe that you're worthy of the highest quality nutrition. You know, and I, I personally sometimes feel like if I'm in a lower place, I'm like, ah, screw it, the cookies and the ice cream and whatever. You know, if I'm in a place where I feel really strong and confident and like, you know what, like, I'm, I'm worth it. And I have to show up and I gotta do this interview thing and the best version of myself. Then all of a sudden I start to feed myself the highest levels of quality. So I think that's an interesting topic with it as well. But yeah, I mean, the nutrition is the building blocks of your connective tissue. Yeah, I'll bring you an example from just this week. Um, you know, I think 
nutrition uh, has so much to do with joint and muscle pain and uh, with autoimmune diseases, things I've actually written about and presented at national meetings. But just this week, uh, I met a woman for the first time who had seen my uh, PA six months ago, and she was on five rheumatoid arthritis medications, including mm. two immunosuppressants. And very dynamic woman, f fascinating meeting her. She's a, a coach for major, uh, for major corporations to get along with each other in, in meetings. So anyhow, she in six months is now off of all of her rheumatoid arthritis medications. Mm. She's negative biomarkers for all markers of rheumatoid arthritis. And she actually was motivated because she was helping corporations have a better culture by teaching them how to interact with each other. And she says, you know, I should be able to teach my body to interact with each other and I should be able to get rid of rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. And my name popped up whenever she keeps searching. And so she, she fixed it by changing the food that she ate. Yeah, I think it's just one of the spokes on the hub. You know, nutrition, there's so many different spokes you need to tend to. And you know, inflammation is like the root of you know, fill in the blank, any kind of disorder you can look up. There's like, oh, inflammation of the fill in the blank. You know, so if at that, including depression, you know, so if you are eating foods that are inflammatory to your system, it's not just that you're not gonna perform well at your sport, it's gonna be performing well in your emotional life, in your relationships, in your business, brain fog. You know, and so that ends up translating directly into your, into more like my world and like your movement practice. Like I find just simply fasting for a short time is one of the most beneficial things that I can do for joint mobility. <laughs> like if I eat a late meal, with you know, whatever BS, 11, 11 p.m., I wake up, the next day, like my mobility is crap. You know, versus if I eat an early dinner the, of meaningful food, because I have the self-worth to do so, um, the next day, sure enough, my mobility is dramatically better. And then if you can, you can move into your movement practice with that newfound mobility, you're able to create these new ranges of motions that you never had access to, because you're always too inflamed to do so. So it's just one of the one of the spokes that I think it's it's like a crucial part. Yeah, and you know, in my book, The Longevity Paradox, we really urge people to have preferably a four, at least a three-hour window between your last meal of the day and going to bed. Great. Uh, it makes such a difference, among other things, in brain cleaning. Yeah. So because of the longevity paradox, I've asked all of my guests to give our listeners one thing that they can do today to start having a better, longer life. Mm. One thing. I think, um, if I can give <laughs> 1.5 things, okay, there's 1. one 5. that I think is like You're the allowed. overarching, really meaningful one, but it's a little bit more pseudoscience, um, but not protecting yourself and your ability to give and receive love. Like I think that that's something that we, you know, we move through the world with this kind of protection and we don't want to truly be seen, so we kind of show people this like artificial sense of ourselves, because if somebody doesn't love and appreciate that part, it doesn't really matter because it was never really you. But at some point, you'll, you'll be at the point where maybe you're not in this body anymore and you'll look back and be like, oh my God, what the hell was I scared of? You know, so I think the sooner that you can just move through the world completely honest with where you're at and who you are with all of your relationships, I think the healthier person you're going to be structurally that's going to affect you but um, something to be really simple is is just hang each day as another just takeaway easy go-to thing there's a whole book called shoulder pain by a guy called dr john kirsch who's an orthopedic surgeon and showed that just through a simple hanging protocol i have a chapter in my book about this of just just simply reaching up get like a pull-up bar in your doorway and as you're walking through that doorway give yourself a little five to ten fifteen second hang and you're going to decompress your shoulder girdle, it literally changes the shape of your shoulder girdle. We typically have more of this medial rotation, which is impingement, All right? So you just go up into that position, decompress that shoulder girdle, start to open up the lungs, re-engage that diaphragm, open up your heart, all your whole cardiovascular system, and bring you back into a more confident position. If you're in this position all the time, it, it starts to hijack the way that you think, the way that you feel, and the feedback that you send out to the rest of the world. So a simple act of just hanging each day can have dramatic impact on your whole life. Believe it or not, I wrote about this for my uh, thesis at Yale University, we are a hanging great ape. Right. And 
we are the only, you know, great apes are brachiators, they hang. Yeah, monkey and bars is a misnomer. It, human bars are ape bars. Yeah, they are, they are, they are ape bars. Yeah. And that's actually what differentiates you know, us from all other monkeys, yeah. uh, our ability to hang. And you're right, we should be hanging. I'm yeah. glad you brought that up. It's, cool. a, it's an important point. Yeah. And I, I've kind of forgotten it. Okay, I'm gonna go hang. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Aaron, it's been great to have you on the podcast. Yeah, thank you. So how do our listeners find you? How do they find more information about you and your work? Probably most people just go to like Instagram and you know, Align Podcast is, is the easiest place, but my website's also Align Podcast. Oh, um, okay. If you just look up Align Podcast, that'll be the thing. And then- What's you your Instagram? Align Podcast. Oh, everything. Everything's Align, everything's Align Podcast. And then on there, there's a, a, a just a really simple five video breakdown of simple fundamentals that, that I know everybody can benefit from. Um, hanging is a part of those, spending more time on the floor is a part of those, and there's a few others. And that's just a great starting point for people to start embodying themselves. And do you have to pay to play? No, 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 that's, that, that's, that's, I have so much content that is of high quality at no cost. And then at the very end of that, there is a deeper online program that exists. But there's, I mean, you could spend a good chunk of your life just exploring the free stuff. Great. All right. Very good. Yeah. So before we end, we always have my favorite part of the podcast, an audience question. Uh, Elisa Marie 022 on Instagram asks, is carob powder allowed on the plant paradox diet? I want to make sure I'm not eating the dangerous lectins. So uh, those of you who are against chocolate uh, think that carob powder is a, probably a pretty good idea. There actually is some evidence that carob has a lectin in it, but my, so I don't use carob powder. My point would be to you, there is so much benefit from cacao in terms of building nerves, of building connections between nerves, in, in uh, dilating your blood vessels, that I think go for the real chocolate and don't go for carob. Uh, that's my humble opinion. There actually is no demonstrable health benefit to, from carob over chocolate. And the studies keep rolling in that if you wanna keep your brain great, get chocolate in your life. So I'll end with that. So if you listeners are enjoying this, I want you to stay tuned because Aaron is going to do a posture assessment on me and you're not going to want to miss that. In fact, I think my wife Penny is going to tune in because she's always correcting my posture and Penny tune in, Aaron's going to fix everything. Don't worry. So Aaron, give the folks viewing a couple of tips that they can do at home to assess their posture. Yep, absolutely. Um, so the first thing is just before you, we're gonna go through this overhead shoulder range of motion. And before we do that, you can just, you could look at yourself in the mirror if that works and just bring your hands, one hand up to the top of the ribs and then bring the other hand down to around the pelvis here. Okay, so you have two, you, ideally you want these hands both to be facing straight. Typically for many people in modern culture, we'll have this tendency of uh, that rib flaring position and the hips jut forward. So just start off and I want your hands to be facing poof, straight ahead like that. The way that you can do that is you can blow all of your air out. Keeping your ribs so that they're, they're straight on top of the pelvis. And then from here, we're gonna just start to bring our arms up overhead as high as you comfortably can, reaching high through those fingertips and not allowing the ribs to flare up. The tendency for people is they go up overhead, range of motion, they just blow, blow out their lower back. We wanna avoid that, keep that strength and integrity through the midsection as we go up through overhead range of motion. So, uh, first thing, I would be curious to check out your shoulder range of motion. You mentioned you have some frozen shoulder stuff? Yep, yep. Okay, so let's just see, first of all, what's your standing position look like before we actually go into the shoulder range of motion? There it is. So if I push down on Dr. Gundry's shoulders, what we want to have happen is that I can actually drive that weight straight from his shoulders all the way down into the feet. The typical tendency for so many people is we'll have the tendency of bringing our hips forward like this, which is just kind of setting the stage for some type of instability in the lower back. So what we're gonna do is just start to bring a little bit more of that, yes, boom. So what we did is we started, almost imagine like you're wearing like a corset in a way. We started to bring a little bit more support through that midsection, 
and we brought the ribs just down, just boop, just a little bit. So as opposed to the ribs, typically people have this like flaring rib thing happening. Oh yeah, I'm told that employee, stop flaring your ribs. Stop flaring your ribs. Yep. So what we're going to do is as you're standing, moving around the world, just give yourself, you could literally bring your, your hands around your abdomen and just blow all of your air out. You'll feel those deep intra-abdominal muscles start to come online and that will start to deflare those ribs. Now, I'm, I mean, you can notice the difference with that is, is pretty dramatic. I can start to really, and straighten the legs a little bit more. Yep. Now I can really drive that weight down through countries, shoulders. Compared to a second ago, let the hips go forward. I was doing that. Pa pow! And it's, it's like a, I can't put any weight. That hurts when you do it like that. Yep. And when I was like this, it didn't hurt. Yep. So yeah. multiply that times 9.8 meters per second square gravity all day long, and you marching and stomping and all that. It's just boof, boof, boof. And that's where most of the disc herniations manifest is L5, S1 territory. So the first thing is just thinking about, okay, let's find that stability through the midsection. Next step from there is we're thinking about, okay, can we raise those arms up overhead? And I want you to start reaching the fingertips down low towards the ground. So you're already almost like tractioning, lengthening those shoulders out. And now from here, keeping that length, slowly start to raise your arms up and maintaining, this is what we're looking at. We're maintaining this stability through the midsection. That's not bad. And now we can feel he's starting to want to take from there. Yeah. That's where we stop. You know, so something that would be of great benefit to you is, like we mentioned in the podcast, is start hanging. If hanging, just free hanging, is too much to start, you could literally simply just like get a, to the edge of a chair and just start bringing yourself into these positions. Or you could hang and put a chair, like a stool down low, so you just start flirting with that process of being in a hang way quicker than you anticipate, I'm sure, you'll actually be able to comfortably do a free hang while maintaining the support through your lower And I could use a band like that. You could use a band like this. So this would be something that I would recommend as well uh, to actually start to activate the backside of the shoulder girdle. So try it one time really quick. So just something you can do is start, you're gonna start, imagine you're breaking the band while you're keeping this midsection poof, engaged, exactly. Now from here, you're starting to turn on that those, those posterior delts, all those muscles in the back. Good, and then slowly coming back down. And then you can even start to rotate the band off to the side, and off to the other side, and up around. And then, something that would be a benefit is using the band to actually go and start to decompress that shoulder joint. So attaching it to a door, and then starting to exactly hinge yourself forward, yep. And then starting to raise that right arm up overhead. Yeah, and so now we can actually traction that joint. Good, beautiful, and then back down. Yep, and so now we're tractioning the joint, we're creating a little myofascial release while we're creating decompression of that joint at the same time. And a little bit of that, I'm gonna let go of it, a little bit of that times hanging would literally change the whole shape of your shoulder girdle. So you've just listened and watched Aaron Alexander from AlignPodcast.com show me how to fix my posture. Listen to us over on Dr. Gundry Podcast to learn a whole lot more. See you next time. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.